For those just joining, we're giving everyone a chance to come in from the waiting room before we kick off today. We're gonna to give it about one more minute before we get started. All right, two minutes in, so figure we should go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us tonight uh, for No Parking Required, Eliminating Costly Parking Mandates. Um, hopefully will be a very enlightening session for those of you who may not have thought much about parking uh, in the course of your daily life. As we mentioned, you, you know, uh, not, not many people think about parking that much, uh, except when they really need a spot in front of their favorite store. They certainly don't think about it having many second, third, fourth, fifth order impacts on how we get around, how we live our lives, and how we maintain our environment in the community around us. Um, we're here to sh share with you tonight a few key details uh, and learnings about parking, um, how it really actually does have a profound impact on our communities, uh, shaping our neighborhoods, influencing our housing costs, uh, figuring out how we get around, the availability of and, and environmental sustainability overall. So we're really excited to welcome a few guests tonight. Um, I'll intro briefly. Uh, first on the agenda, as you can see on the screen, is uh, Representative Stephanie Vigil, uh, who will be introducing a bill in this legislative session related to limiting minimum parking requirements. After that, we'll have Matthew Fromer uh, from SWEEP talking about the, giving us a little bit more detail on eliminating, eliminating parking mandates and the impact that has uh, or could have on the community around us. Following that, uh, John Hersey on the line here will lead a panel discussion with a few special guests, Katie McKenna, Kevin Knapp, and Shannon Cox Baker, um, all working for affordable housing development agencies. We'll con con conclude with a bit of Q&A. That said, just as a housekeeping element here, please do feel free to submit questions either in the Q&A feed uh, or in the chat in the duration of the session. We'll be keeping an eye out for them. We will stick to just the programming for the first, you know, 30, 45 minutes here, and we'll go back and review questions and bring them for our guests and panelists at the end. Um, don't want to interrupt too much of the flow of the conversation here, and also want to make sure that we get all the information out before we start answering questions about these things. Uh, so with that, I'm very excited to pass it over to Representative Veal. Hi, everyone. Oh, not getting the snaps. Yay. Um, hi there. Thanks so much for having me. It's really great to be on here. Uh, Steph B. Hill, I represent uh, Central Colorado Springs, HD 16. Um, I am uh, a kind of a diehard urbanist. I came into this uh, position uh, hoping very much to act on housing, both supply side and preservation of existing stock and renter protections, very all of the above. Um, and also um, a little bit obsessed with multimodal transportation. Um, I'm a multimodal traveler myself. I do drive, but I also have an e-bike. I walk, I take the local bus in the Springs. I take the bus thing to Denver. Um, and I'm just really, um, really dedicated at this point in my uh, early point in my political career um, to getting Colorado on track to allow everybody to get around, get around our state and be able to live, work and play here, happy, healthy and without being forced to have a car um, or to, you know, shell out their entire income just to pay rent and a car payment. Um, so one of the things I've really latched on to over the last few years um, has been the parking minimums issue. Um, I don't believe in silver bullets per se or like one weird trick to fix all of our problems, but I do feel like this one is sorely overlooked. And while we're talking about, um, you know, trying to advance missing middle and, and do more condos and, uh, you know, um, legalize duplexes and ADUs, and all, it's all very good stuff. But one of the biggest uh, space sucks that we have um, in the way that we develop is to demand that private property provide storage for cars absolutely everywhere we go in our home and every single destination we could want to go to. Um, we've gotten really used to it, I think, in the post-war era in particular, um, where we've kind of told ourselves that there's such a thing as free parking if we just force developers to build it um, and don't allow anyone to infill without adding even more of it. Um, but the reality is there's no such thing as free parking. Uh, by definition, it is uh, empty real estate that is waiting for someone to store their car there while they go do the thing they actually traveled for, um, and which means that it's empty space that isn't generating revenue. There's nothing happening on it. It's not housing anybody. Um, and to boot, we have now um, significant water runoff heat island issues 
Um, we have public health and safety issues related to excessive parking because deserted spaces are not safe spaces. Uh, we are inhibiting our ability to fill out multimodal transportation, and we've gotten caught in this vicious cycle um, that I feel like a lot of a lot of residents in my constituency who I talked to at the doors when I ran for this office, um, they actually seem pretty despondent about. And I hate the idea of people feeling like that'll never change. Um, and so they they don't feel particularly compelled to, you know, to to advance leaders who will do it. Um, but I decided to step up and be that person anyway, because the number one complaint I got at the doors when I ran for this seat uh, was high speed traffic, high speed traffic and the proliferation of cars and the fact that there aren't transportation choices in our city and that we're kind of like losing the nicest parts about Colorado Springs to uh, vehicle exhaust and noise and the danger that comes with it. And so uh, we need to break that cycle. That That's kind of where I'm at at this point, right? We've got it's sort of this whole this whole negative feedback loop of, well, we can't do more transportation choice because we don't have the density for it. And so everybody, quote unquote, not actually everybody, but most people will just get around, will get around with the car. It's like, okay, well, why don't we have the density? Well, we don't have the density because we have to make room for the cars. And at some point, we just have to decide that our communities are for us. They are not for the automobile industry. Uh, they are not to be uh, paved over. We've literally paved paradise to put up a parking lot, right? Um, and if we don't at some point disrupt that vicious cycle and create other options, um, it is never going to change. And it's my belief that this goes beyond uh, local jurisdictions. It's multi-jurisdictional. It's a statewide issue. And also the state has the purse strings to help developers and local governments right size the parking, do uh, demand management strategies, do parking sharing, get the right kind of tools and data so that this can be done effectively um, without without um, having an unintended fallout of a, a total lack of parking or whatever, whatever it is that people People fear. Um, I'm really big on uh, getting this over the finish line as strong as possible. Um, you know, I did not, uh, I did not introduce a compromised bill. I introduced a minimally compromised bill with um, room for negotiation that I, I hope pleases most of our uh, most of our affordable housing partners, our transportation nerds, um, our environmental lobby friends, uh, to get as strong of a bill passed as we possibly can. Um, still need to do a lot of stakeholder work on it. Obviously, at the Capitol, we got, we try to give everybody an ear and a, and a chance to kind of find some common ground and, and meet in the middle somewhere. But I just think it's so important that we that we break this vicious cycle and start to create more choices for Coloradans. Everybody needs to get around. Not everybody needs to be in a car. Not everybody wants to have a car. And I think we can do this in such a way that every everybody, every ability, every budget has their needs met um, and we can we can get out of this. So I will stop there. Um, and I thank you so much for for your time and attention on this. The bill is about to be read over the desk kind of any day now. I need to send one more email. Thank you, Representative Veal. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more at the end about how you can get involved and how you can help get this bill passed uh, once we conclude the session today. Uh, thank you again so much for the introduction. Um, and with that, we will pass over to Matt Fromer here, um, who will give us a little bit more, uh, like pull, pull a little bit more out of uh, some of the high level topics that Representative Veal just touched on. Excellent, thanks, Jonathan. And thank you, Representative Veal, for your leadership on this bill. Um, like I said, my name is Matt Fromer. I work for a nonprofit called the Southwest Energy Efficiency Project, or SWEEP, uh, where I work on transportation, land use, and climate policy across the Southwest. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about eliminating parking mandates. Uh, title of the presentation is More Housing, More Businesses at Lower Cost, and Still Plenty of Parking. Um, so getting into it, uh, first, I just want to level set here and define what we mean by parking mandates. So today, New developments must include a certain amount of off-street parking. These are mandates in local zoning codes. They're also referred to as minimum parking requirements, and they're typically expressed as a number of parking spaces per home or bedroom or per square foot of office, retail, or commercial space. Uh, importantly, parking minimums are calculated to exceed demand, so there are always empty spaces. Okay, so why are parking mandates a problem and representative VL to a nice job with the overview here. This is what we're gonna cover in the presentation here, but parking mandates tend to increase housing costs. They limit the supply of new housing, especially affordable housing. Uh, they waste valuable urban space and make our communities more car dependent, which leads to more driving, 
pollution and higher transportation costs. They generate sprawl and prevent walkability. They hurt local businesses and hinder economic development, and they penalize those who do not own a car. So starting off here, parking mandates make housing more expensive and limit supply, which exacerbates Colorado's housing crisis. I think we have the sixth highest housing costs in the country. As Representative Vigil said, there is no such thing as free parking. In fact, parking is quite expensive. Um, on average, about $9,000 per space for a surface lot and then up to $50,000 per space for an underground parking spot, um, about $35,000 for a space in a structured parking garage. Builders need to recover these costs some way. So typically they bundle them into the price of goods, services, and housing, adding a, an average of about $225 per month to average rents, even for people who don't own a car. So this makes housing more expensive. A study from the Victoria Transport Policy Institute found that one parking space per unit raises the cost of that unit by about 12.5%. Adding a second parking space doubles that to about 25% increase in the housing costs. Uh, I do want to make a distinction here between market rate housing and affordable. For market rate housing, the developers do have an opportunity to just add the cost of parking onto the price of rent or the price of that home. Uh, whereas for affordable housing, we're really limiting those monthly rents based on income, right? So developers don't have the same opportunity to just sort of pass it along, pass those, those parking costs along to their tenants and residents. They have to come up with the, 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 the parking um, and the cost of parking and recover that in, in different ways. Um, and so what that typically means in a lot of cases, and we'll, we'll cover some examples later, is that we end up sacrificing new affordable homes to build more parking. Parking mandates are inefficient and unfair to rental and low-income households um, who proportionally have fewer cars and often pay for parking they do not need or want. And here's a graphic on the right, a study that uh, John Hersey, who's on the call and you're here from later, put together uh, when he was with RTD along, alongside NC State, um, where they looked at car ownership rates for low-income and market rate households near transit and found that the majority of low-income households near transit do not own a vehicle. Um, and yet, most municipalities in Colorado mandate somewhere between 1.5 and 2.5 parking spaces per multifamily home. I also want to highlight this study from ShopWorks and Fox Tuttle. They looked at affordable housing projects in the Front Range, found that about half of the parking spaces in those affordable projects are used during peak periods. Um, and there's a, a, a dramatic oversupply, specifically in the zero to 30% AMI range, where only about 8.8% of households own vehicles. So one unit out of every 12 are going to utilize uh, the parking facility. More parking means less housing. Uh, so here's sort of a, a diagram with a few graphics to look at uh, sort of the trade-offs between parking mandates at the local level and the amount of buildable area the, the size of the building you can put on that lot. Uh, in most markets, um, the cost to build underground parking or structured parking uh, is prohibitive for that project. So lots of developers in most communities opt for surface parking. Uh, but what that means is you have less space for the building itself. So here's what sort of the impact of the parking ratios at 0 0.5 spaces, one space and 1.5 spaces per unit on the size of that building, the number of homes and the amount of commercial space one can build. Um, and when we talk to developers to try to get a sense of really the cumulative impacts of local parking mandates on, on housing and on commercial development, uh, one thing we heard is it's really tough to calculate the cumulative impact because a lot of these projects may never get off the ground. One of the first things developers look at uh, when they consider a project is uh, the parking requirement. And if they find that they can't deliver enough units at the right price points or enough commercial space, to make the project pencil, uh, they won't even pursue it in the first place. So we, we don't actually know the full um, cost, the opportunity cost of local par parking mandates on housing and commercial development. Uh, we did collect a few stories from developers with market rate and affordable housing uh, in along the front range. And I just wanna share a couple with you now, not to steal a thunder from our, from our great panel that's coming up later, uh, but here are just a couple uh, first, we have uh, the Ridge of Thornton Station. This is a 280-unit market rate housing project. 
They ended up sacrificing about 100 homes uh, because they were forced to basically meet local parking minimums instead of matching supply uh, with demand. We have the Caraway in Adams County, 116 unit affordable housing project. Um, developers uh, from the housing authority there said they sac had to sacrifice 44 homes to meet the, the local parking mandates. University Station Apartments in Denver, this is 60 homes for seniors, but could have had 60 more homes if not for local parking mandates. And then lastly, an interesting new project proposal in William, called the Williams Point in Lakewood, 44 units, 100% affordable, 71 parking spaces required by the city of Lakewood. Um, and this project was actually denied a request to reduce the parking by 20%. Uh, so the developer is going to have to come up with a, a million dollar parking garage added to the existing project costs. Um, as Representative Vihill said, all of this required parking really adds up um, and we can dedicate a lot of our urban space to parking. Um, this is actually a map from Yimby Denver's own Ryan Kenny from 2016, where he mapped the land in downtown Denver. It's dedicated to parking in the yellow there. Um, and, and again, this really does add up. There's some estimates out there showing that there are roughly eight parking spaces for every one car in the U.S. Uh, so plenty of opportunity to in increase efficiency, to optimize the use of existing parking spaces. <clears throat> Here are the results of a study that RTD put together back in 2020, 2021, uh, where actually John Hersey and his colleagues did some parking counts at 86 station area, station area housing properties, both market rate and affordable. Um, what they found is that the market rate properties, about 40% of the parking spaces were unused during peak periods. For affordable housing properties, that number went up to 50% of parking spaces unused at peak periods. And all of this really adds up. Uh, total across those 86 housing properties, we're talking about 9,602 empty parking spaces at a cost of $270 million, which could instead have bought uh, about 1,000 new affordable homes. This graphic at the bottom, each one of the bars represents one of those 86 housing projects. Uh, the blue represents the used parking spaces, and then the red is the empty. So you can kind of see the variation there. Um, and then we, we did take a look at local parking codes in the along the front range here. Um, and specifically here, what's required in transit areas. Some cities do have reduced parking requirements near frequent transit, for example. Uh, but you can see it's 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 all over the map. These are pretty arbitrary. We we modeled this for a hypothetical 15 multifamily project near transit. Uh, and I compared it to, you can see the red lines there. Those represent the findings from the RTD study uh, of average parking utilization for market rate. So 0.74 spaces per unit versus affordable housing, 0.36 spaces per unit. Each of these municipalities requires a lot more parking um, than than uh, these projects would demand. Um, I, I do wanna just clarify that this doesn't suggest that there are any sort of perfect levels at which to set minimum parking mandates. Um, there's quite a range in parking utilization and looking at the RTB uh, study of 86 properties, some utilization was as low as 25, 27% with a 0 0.15, 0 0.18 um, parking ratio for, for demand. Uh, so it really depends on context, proximity to amenities, transit, jobs, is there ability to share parking with a nearby office building? There's a lot that goes into um, the project design. It's just better left to the experts, those who build these projects. Getting into the impacts on commercial development. So parking mandates do hurt local businesses and hinder economic development by forcing excess parking along main streets that should be pedestrian friendly and walkable. And here I think about some of our favorite walkable main streets in the region at Pearl Street and Boulder, Pearl Street and Denver, Tennyson, South Broadway. These are all um, walkable main streets and storefronts mixed with residential that were built before minimum parking mandates. Um, had, they're basically illegal to build today. And if, we, if you tried, you can imagine basically erasing every other or two of every three storefronts and instead putting uh, a parking other parking garage or surface parking lot there, which would make the whole community less walkable. And these are some of our, our most popular, most desirable neighborhoods to be in and to live in. 
Um, like I said, the commercial parking mandates are, are pretty arbitrary. Just to provide one example here, um, uh, the developer wants to build a new bar, uh, which in my opinion shouldn't require parking anyway, um, since it seems to encourage drunk driving. But if you did, um, that bar would require one parking space per 150 square feet in Greenwood Village, per 100 square feet in Thornton, or end per three seats in Louisville. In all cases, dedicating more space to parking than to running the business. Um, I also want to point out you know, a lot of businesses are concerned that a lack of parking will hurt their business, but a lot of studies should also show that businesses overestimate the share of customers who arrive by car, and also that pedestrians and cyclists tend to spend more time and money at local businesses if they can access them. This is a really interesting example from the city of Longmont, who's been a real trailblazer on parking reform. Uh, they removed uh, parking requirements for commercial development in 2014. So some good data since then. They also removed uh, minimum parking requirements for multifamily residential development near transit and downtown. And uh, just a couple of years ago, after a parking study found that but between 15 and 50% of those parking spaces were, were unused. Uh, I did steal some aerial photos from uh, Ben Ortiz's presentation. He's a planner at the city of Longmont. Um, the project on the top is a, a fast food restaurant in downtown Longmont that was built uh, before parking reform. So a, a 5,000 square foot building and they required 53 parking spaces. Compared to that to this very similar project uh, that was built after parking reform, so when they got rid of the commercial parking requirements, a 2,800 square foot building with just nine parking spaces. That project on the bottom would not have been possible uh, with the old minimum parking requirements. And so that lot would be empty or the business owner would be forced to buy a neighboring, more land essentially to build more parking. Um, so this really does enable commercial development. This is right along Main Street in Longmont. Parking mandates also reinforce car dependence which leads to more driving, pollution, sprawl, and other environmental problems, which Representative Vigil touched on. Uh, excessive parking is directly linked to higher car ownership. Um, this also undermines our investments in transit and increases vehicle miles traveled and greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, in Colorado and nationally, transportation is the leading source of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, it's also the sector with the biggest deficit in meeting the 2025 and 2030 greenhouse gas reduction targets at the state level. Both CDOT and Dr. Cog have actually listed uh, parking reform as one of the key climate strategies that we need to pursue. Oversized parking lots also push destinations further apart, making our communities less walkable and transit friendly. And I'm sure lots of people have, have experienced shopping centers like I have in, in the aerial photo on the right there, very car dependent, hard to walk from the shopping on the right to the shopping on the left and most people will drive. Uh, massive surface parking lots also increase the heat island effect, flooding, and soil and water pollution. Okay, so what happens when we get rid of parking mandates? Uh, I, I want to be clear here. So eliminating parking mandates, eliminating parking mandates would not stop new parking spaces from being built. Rather, it would give each project the flexibility to have the amount of parking that it needs. And we have some good data from places that have eliminated parking mandates. This is a great study from Seattle who removed par uh, parking mandates in certain neighborhoods back in 2012. In the following five years, they found that developers built 40% fewer parking spaces than they would have, that, that would have been previously mandated, resulting in 18,000 fewer parking spaces and saving $537 million. Minneapolis removed parking mandates in 2021 leading to a 30% reduction in parking. Typical rents of studio apartments fell 17% in buildings without parking. Oregon passed parking reform in 2023 through state uh, regulation, which requires cities to address parking mandates. And as of January of this year, 13 jurisdictions have ended parking mandates. And then most recently, the Minnesota state legislature uh, introduced a bill that would eliminate parking mandates statewide. Closer to home, we have evidence from Denver and that uh, Denver uh, eliminated parking mandates in several neighborhoods decades ago. But we looked at some of the recently completed housing projects in these neighborhoods. So 
Uh, and what we found was that builders still provide plenty of parking. Across the 105 projects we looked at, the average was 0 0.84 parking spaces per unit and quite a bit of range here. You can see on the bottom, that's a histogram, uh, different projects and, and the parking ratio per project. You'll see that most projects provided somewhere between 0 0.6 and 1.2 spaces per unit, but quite a few went lower than that. Um, and we know a few of them actually went down all the way to zero for deeply affordable housing projects. Um, one developer got really creative and um, basically has a shared uh, parking agreement with a neighboring uh, property owner um, who has a, a, an office parking garage that's mostly empty now. A lot of those employees are now teleworking. And so it's sort of a win-win for the residential developer and the commercial property owner. We can use some of those spaces um, and, and take advantage of existing parking. Um, had the city kept its old parking minimums, which they still have in major the majority of city, which is the ratio of one parking space per unit, it would have resulted in 17% more spaces, about 4,180 spaces, um, and uh, and that and the, the associated cost is $146 million um, in unnecessary spending on empty parking. And, and then lastly, um, I just want to emphasize here, removing parking mandates is not the panacea, it's not the silver bullet, like Representative Vihel said, but a lot of other complementary policies and tools we need to right-size parking and reduce uh, parking demand. Um, so first off, and we have some of this um, in the, the bill that's gonna be introduced, um, to get better data on existing par parking utilization for projects in different locations to better inform new projects. Um, second on the list is our transportation demand management strategies. So things like transit improvements, transit passes for residents, things like eco passes, bicycle amenities, and other financial incentives. Um, some cities have instituted parking maximums in certain areas to prevent uh, developers from overbuilding their parking in areas that we want to be more walkable and dense mixed use. Um, then next, we have the SUMP parking principle. So SUMP stands for uh, first shared parking. And we have a nice diagram on the, the right here kind of showing an opportunity where a residential building that has higher parking demand at night can share parking with an office building who has higher parking demand during the day. You can see that on the bottom um, and just reduce the to total overall parking supply and cost that way. Um, second is unbundling parking. This is a big one, basically just separating the cost of the parking space uh, from the cost of housing and giving people an opportunity to opt out and save money as has been shown and actually reduce parking demand. The M stands for managed travel demand for those, those TDM programs. Um, P is for pay, paid parking uh, to, to really optimize the use of existing on-street parking with off-street parking. And then parking cash out programs, which are typically offered by employers, uh, basically cash in lieu of an employee parking space to give um, people the opportunity to really opt out of parking. I'm just gonna leave you with this slide. Uh, which city would you rather live in? The one on the left with high parking minimums where most space is used for driving and parking or the one on the right uh, with demand responsive parking where most space is used for people. Thank you so much, right. Matt. I, uh, I feel like I, I just went back to class. So, so much good info um, and thank you all for the comments in the chat as well. I've been following along. Uh, great, great information. Uh, so so we're going to turn now to our panel. Um, I'm very happy to have with us tonight uh, Katie McKenna, Kevin Knapp, and Shannon Cox Baker. Uh, Katie McKenna is a member of Archway Community's real estate development team, where she works to advance development projects to support health and affordable communities, healthy and affordable communities throughout Colorado. Uh, Katie has expertise in housing policy, community-based leadership development, organizational sustainability affordable multifamily development, affordable home ownership, and community land trusts. Um, Katie looks forward to leveraging these skills to advocate for equitable and inclusive housing policy. Uh, Kevin Knapp is the Vice President of Development at Ulysses Development Group and has spent the uh, previous 15 years in Boulder County developing affordable housing in both public and private sector roles. Uh, in his current role with UDG, Kevin is focused on the transit-oriented development of 152 affordable homes at the Harvest Hill Project in Broomfield, Colorado, a few blocks from a bus rapid transit station, uh, among other affordable housing development pursuits. 
Uh, and last but certainly not least, Shannon Cox Baker is a regional vice president at Penrose, uh, responsible for growing the company's portfolio of affordable and middle income housing communities in Colorado, Utah, and Arizona. Uh, based in Denver, Shannon has been an advocate and developer of equitable housing strategies throughout Colorado for over 20 years. Uh, it is an all-star panel, and um, I, I'm going to ask them some pressing questions, but of course, I encourage the audience to chime in with uh, in chat or in the uh, Q&A panel as well. All right, so let's get started. Um, so Matt touched on uh, a few projects. Matt touched on a lot, let's be honest, but uh, he also identified a handful of projects that have been affected by parking mandates all over Colorado. Uh, I'd like to ask each of you to highlight a project that comes to mind for you. I, I think we'll start with Katie and then go to Kevin and then Shannon, please. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks, John. Um, and it's so fun to be here. I spend a lot of time thinking about housing and love it. Um, I'm really passionate about making sure that everyone in Colorado has an affordable place that they can live. But what I never considered when I was getting into this is how much time I would spend thinking about parking. And it's definitely a uh, important and relevant part of my job. Uh, at Archway Communities, we're always thinking about the residents who will live in our buildings, um, families, be it families, seniors, people who've experienced homelessness. And it's really important to us that they have, that the housing that we're providing enhances the quality of life and provides everything that folks need to um, get settled, have an affordable place to live, and then pursue the goals that they uh, want for themselves. And parking is a part of that. So by no means would, um, in most cases, would we build housing without parking. I think for, when I think about it, it's more the ability to right size parking. And I've seen projects that both do that and um, opportunities uh, where affordable housing might fit that, you know, parking has been a challenge. Um, one property I uh, was looking at recently for potential affordable housing development that Archway decided not to move forward on was in Lakewood and it was about an acre and a half site and had a relatively dense zoning right along a transit corridor with a high frequency bus line and access to a lot of really great resources like a health center, child care, and uh, schools right nearby. Um, so checked a lot of the boxes for places that we want to build affordable housing. And when it came down to really looking at the zoning, um, understanding exactly what could be built there, it ended up being the parking requirements that uh, made us pass on the site. Uh, at the end of the day, we would have been to build about 39 affordable homes with 79 parking spots. Um, we couldn't imagine a scenario where the population that we would be housing there would need that much parking and, um, you know, just really couldn't justify a land acquisition cost that was going to be for more parking places than people. Um, and so unfortunately, despite it being what, you know, I thought otherwise was a pretty good location for affordable housing, um, you know, at least uh, we won't be building it there right now. So that's a recent example. Uh, have lots of other things to consider, um, but I know Kevin and Shannon probably have some on their mind too. So I'll pass it on. What do you say, Kevin? Cool, thanks, Katie, and thanks, John, for that very generous introduction that I sent to you this morning. It was great. I have, uh, you know, I, this comes up in every project. It seems like every project comes back to parking and the and the parking requirements. You know, for for an example, I'm <clears throat> working on one project right now within Broomfield. Um, it is one that that John referred to, and it's uh, right across from the First Bank Center, and so right on US 36 near Broomfield Station, ladder and fly are going every 10 minutes, you know, arriving in both directions. And so, you know, there we're, we're about halfway in between Union Station and uh, downtown Boulder Station. So, you know, pretty easy to, to get around. There's uh, there's other bus routes that are within walking distance very near to that. And in Broomfield, like many municipalities, there is not a change in the parking requirement for the transit-oriented nature of the project. Um, nor is there any, any change 
uh, also similar to most municipalities for the affordability and, and the affordable component of it. And I bring that up not just because you know we think of incomes and maybe lower income uh, folks who own less cars, it's because of the compliance requirements within affordable housing, where it's one household per unit. And a lot of times that's a single head of household, uh, you know, one person of, of driving age who may or may not have a car. And so here in, in this uh, in this example, we had our parking analysis completed. And so we, we hire the, the Fox Tettles of the world and the other parking analysis that stake out other similar parking, um, other similar communities. And they'll show up at three o'clock in the morning and count each car in the parking lot to figure out what is that real parking demand. And for this project, we came down to about 0.75 uh, parking ratio, or you know, three quarters of a parking space per residential unit. Although in Broomfield, the requirement is two and a half spaces for a three bedroom unit, two spaces for a two bedroom unit, one and a half spaces for a one bedroom unit, all far exceeding what, what the actual demand is. So we ended up with a situation where, you know, here's this market demand that, you know, or Demand study tells us that we have a, you know, a requirement, not a requirement, a suggestion of demand to provide 114 vehicle spaces. We have the requirement from the uh, city and county of Broomfield that says you need 304 parking spaces. That is a 200 space surplus of parking of, you know, extremely expensive land that could uh, more be uh, better be utilized for, um, for housing, in my opinion. And when you get down to the you know, I'll pass it off to Shannon here, but what I find really interesting about this challenge is that you know, everything we do as developers is informed of the market research and market study. And so I view parking similar to an amendment. You know, if my market study says I could really use a swimming pool or a fitness center, and that's what the clients have, you know, I can choose to either include that amenity or not. If my parking analysis says you need a certain amount of parking, that is not allowed. You need to go back to the parking minimum and build way more than uh, what is needed in a lot of different, uh, you know, in most municipalities here. So that's my two cents. I'll uh, pass it off to Shannon. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Kevin. Um, um, I'm just going to give two quick examples of um, two projects that fortunately um, were able to one take advantage of a really favorable. Um, parking requirement that's a, a homeless development that we have under construction in Denver. And then um, in the city of Longmont, uh, Penrose is uh, partnered with the Longmont Housing Authority on a very different project, 75 units of family housing. And the Longmont uh, code actually, while it does have some parking requirements, some of which might sound um, a little, you know, uh, conservative, um, you know, in terms of parking requirements uh, based on unit size or bedroom count, um, they also kind of counterbalance that with some incentives and, and reductions that are available to affordable housing. And so uh, for the development in Denver, um, we were able to, you know, take advantage of the 0.1 space requirement for a 100% um, homeless development. So it's um. Units are all uh, income restricted at 30% AMI. It's for young adults ages 18 to 24 who are uh, aging out of foster care, experiencing homelessness. And so, you know, with a requirement of only six spaces, um, that was a game changer for us. I mean, we had a, a very small site to work with and that allowed us to build 56 apartments and only, actually it's, it's seven spaces because we had to add a, add a loading zone as well. But um, Huge, huge, huge uh, cost savings for that project. I mean, we we're able to accommodate that with a very small surface parking lot um, and not take up too much area. Um, the project in Longmont, um, the if if we had just met the code as it was written, we would have provided I think 124 spaces for 75 apartments, and you know um, we we couldn't fit that. Um, the way we've got the site designed, we're we're actually going to park it around a hundred spaces, which you know is still over one space per unit. Um, but we've got a, a pretty significant number of three and four bedroom units in that development. And this is where you know we were um, fortunate to be able to to work with the city of Longmont to work within their code, which again was very favorable to affordable housing. 
But to just kind of use our own experience and to really rely on Longmont Housing Authority's experience, they have a deep portfolio, they know what their car ownership rates are amongst their tenant population, and they said, you know, we, we really can't afford to do this at less than one space per unit. We've done that before. We've got a lot of um, two-car households in our four-bedroom, you know, units. Sometimes that's multi-generational housing with multiple adults um, and, you know, older children. Um, and so, again, we were able to kind of use our own logic, um, use our own rationale and size the parking um, to meet our needs. And um, not have to be have that dictated to us. So I, I think those are just two examples of where there's when given flexibility, you know, uh, developers will size parking to what they feel like their tenants really need. Yeah, thank you. If there's one thread in all of that, I think uh, it, it's developers love predictability, right? You, you all thrive on being predictable and knowing what the schedule is and the budget is and, and yada, yada, yada. And working across communities, Lakewood, Broomfield, Longmont, Denver, I mean, everyone has their own mandates, their own expectations, their own way of doing business. Um, I, I have to think that that introduces a lot of complexity and unpredictability to the work that you're trying to do, the, the important work you're trying to do. Um, and my second question, you know, as, as Representative Vigil and Matt stressed, eliminating parking mandates will not eliminate parking provision. You know, developers still will build parking to position their projects and the neighborhoods in their projects, within around their projects, for success. Uh, you don't want to op open a, a new project and have it fail or, or affect the value of the neighborhood around it. Um, so without mandates, let's imagine a world where the bill is approved, parking mandates eliminated in, in communities across Colorado. How would you determine how much parking to provide at a given project in that future case? Maybe we'll start with Shannon this time. We'll go backwards. How about that? Yeah, thanks. I'll, I'm happy to jump right in. I have another, you know, couple of good examples. So, um, so I have a, two senior developments. These would be age restricted, affordable properties um, for uh, elders, age elders. I say elders, um, 55 and up, which doesn't sound that old. Um, and uh, one's in Superior, and then the other one uh, is planned in downtown Phoenix. So same exact population, same size building, same income range. Um, for those of you who are, are familiar with um, downtown Superior, you know, there's there's good bus transit, but this isn't this isn't a TOD site, right? It's not like right at the RTD station. Uh, so for that project, we're looking at around 0.8 spaces per unit is, is what we want to design for that site. Because we do think um, based on, you know, uh, what we know about car ownership rates and about, you know, walkability um, and just amongst the, the aging population that car ownership rates and, and dependence on cars is still pretty high. Um, contrast that with the, the development we're pursuing in downtown Phoenix, it's within maybe 50 steps of a light rail line. Um, so very, very transit connected. There, we're hoping to be able to build less than you know, 10 spaces of parking for at least 65 units of housing. So I think when you, you know, think about the elimination of mandates, you're, we're still going to fall back on our own experience, our depth of our portfolios, what we've seen work, what we've seen fail, um, and then obviously look to our competition as well. And I think, again, as developers, like you said, John, we do like predictability, and we're always kind of watching and tempering what we're doing with where the market is as well. Uh, thanks, Shane. <clears throat> Kevin, you want to jump in? Yeah, those were uh, good examples. I um, I think right now Denver's a great, you know, sort of uh, testing ground for this since they have been able to, to lower the ability to provide less parking. Um, I'm uh, involved in a project that had a concept review approval this week from the city of Denver where we are providing uh, less than one half parking space per residential unit. And overall, the entire project is about 1,000 units. And so we're talking about you know very limited uh, parking, but at the same time, it's it's consistent with the study that you showed from uh, from RTD, saying that hey, this is affordable housing. It's transit oriented. There's you know great uh, public transit, uh, frequent high quality public transit in the area. So this is what that supply actually, or that this is what the demand actually is for that parking. 
So it, it'll be a little bit of a test case. Uh, I think it'll be interesting to, um, to see how that works out. But my viewpoint on it is that it's not for everyone. You know, if you're a family that has three cars, you're going to come into the leasing office and they're going to tell you, which probably isn't the best, you know, the best spot. We have limited limited cars. Some families will be allowed a car. Some, some families will not have a car. But it's similar to if you have a dog and you go to a lease a place that doesn't allow dogs. You've got to find out pretty quick, this isn't the right place for you. And that's okay. You know, not, not everything is, is right for everyone. Uh, as we saw from, I saw, you know, somebody posted a, a link to you know, the actual census information of the people that don't have a car, or maybe if households that just have one car within Colorado, that's kind of the market that we see um, that we're catering towards. And we, we want to provide, you know, the transit passes and, you know, the ability to you know, take the train out to the airport for you know, our employment center, take the train down to downtown Denver, another big employment center, or any of the other big, um, uh, you know, be able to take transit and other TDM uh, amenities for, you know, all your other transportation needs. Thanks, Scott. Yeah. What do you think, Katie? I can um, jump in. I agree with, and we do the exact same things that um, Kevin and Shannon shared. You know, look at uh, market data, look at comparables, look at transportation access. And some of the other things that we do is we talk to our residents. Um, so we really look to um, similar types of buildings and households and we do a needs assessment every year and we're talking about what are your parking needs are you thinking about uh, electric cars are you thinking about more transit usage are you riding a bicycle um, you know what is your transportation situation looking like these days um, and we use that to inform future developments. Uh, we also really uh, take into consideration special needs of our population. So often a resident may not need a parking space, but they do have in-home healthcare providers or family members who are visiting. And we were able to think about those types of parking spaces a little bit differently than just a blanket two parking spaces for everyone. Often family visits in the evening for for example, an in-home health care happens during the day. So one parking space can accomplish uh, multiple needs. Um, another thing that we're thinking about as we're building affordable housing, we're building it, uh, we're building sturdy buildings that are going to last 50, 100 years into the future. And so we want to accommodate what's needed today, but we really want to have an eye towards the future as well and boxing ourselves into giant concrete structures parking lots is not really our first choice much of the time, knowing that in the future, uh, you know, in, in a lot of our state, we'll have the opportunity for more transportation without vehicles. I love that example, Katie, about, you know, a, a senior property, uh, knowing that there, there will be different demands based on the time of day with home health aides or other visitors coming through. I mean, you, you know your project better than any zoning code for mandates would. So, so yeah, eliminating these mandates will allow you to be more creative and, and deliberate and tailored to the demands of your property. Absolutely. Fantastic. Uh, I want to, I recognize we're a little at time, we're bleeding into the Q&A. So I think this will be our last question or my last question to you. And if there are other questions for the Q&A, uh, feel free to, to throw in. Um, you know, some argue that parking mandates position cities and developers to negotiate for mutual benefits or a quid pro quo. You reduce, if the city reduces its minimums, its mandates, then the developer will build more affordable housing or, or whatever the case may be. Um, in your opinion, are parking mandates useful in this way, um, or are there more effective ways to achieve those mutual benefits? Uh, let's start with Kevin for change. How about that? Sure. Yeah, those, those negotiations are uh, also referred to as extractions. You know, what, what, what does the city really need from you? And I think for, for us in, in our business, you know, time is really kills pride. Unpredictability, John, as you mentioned, is what really kills us. And so the best situation for us is not being at the negotiating table, not having to go through uh, this public process where we're going to be requesting um, we're going to be requesting a, a parking reduction. And you know, when you do something out of code, you know, like asking for a reduction, a lot of times it opens it up for a public hearing. And I think 
you know, what a lot of uh, what a developers think is that I'm just going to subject myself to the process and that risk. You know, I'm just going to provide the parking and provide less homes because that provides me with more certainty as I'm spending money every day on designing and engineering a new project. That, that's my take on, you know, opening up the negotiations. I think, you know, a lot of what the city looks like are all good faith things that can improve the community, can improve, can improve the project, but, right. you know, yeah, getting, getting, back to the, is that. getting back to the unpredictable nature of, of what you're getting into. Uh, Katie or Shannon, do either of you have uh, an opinion on the matter? I can just chime in that, um, you know, I think of, parking like any other amenity and we're really conscious about what a building and what new housing developments need um, and, you know, view it as similar to um, laundry or a roof deck with a grill or a gym. We know that those are parts of our residential life that are important to residents. We know that that improves health and it improves improves community connections. Um, and so we consider them into our buildings. Parking is just like that. Uh, personally, it's not my most favorite used amen amenity, but it's an amenity nonetheless, and we don't really need uh, to be negotiating with jurisdictions or often what happens is negotiation with the public through, uh, you know, public process related to approvals of projects. You know they're they're not weighing in on the laundry machines. Why does it need to be parking? Yeah, I'm not going to weigh in because it. The, I'll just I'll just spin out. So I agree with what every everything Katie and and Kevin said. I I think uh, yeah. I think at the end of the day we're very data driven, and and when these negotiations become more about values, um, that's when things get a little sticky. Well said, Shan. Things get sticky. Uh, okay, well, thank you. Thank you to our panel. Uh, if you don't mind sticking around, I think Jonathan may have some questions in the chat. Is that so, Jonathan? Absolutely. We have a few questions from the crowd. Uh, really appreciate uh, your first introduction there. I'll start off with a question for Shannon in particular. Um, is the development you described as intergenerational adult children and four bedroom units an affordable housing development? Some group graf grassroots allies are concerned that with higher occupancy, multi-generational living situations, restricting parking will make life difficult for occupants to get to work. What are your thoughts? Yeah, no, that's that's why we really wrestled with this one. Um, it is affordable housing. This is a development in uh, Longmont, it's not downtown Longmont, it's on Hover Road, so it's a little bit uh, peripheral, but there are a lot of amenities that are within walking distance, a lot of uh, small scale uh, retail establishments. Um, there's also a, a bus line on Hover. Um, there is a path of, that would connect folks for recreational amenities, um, schools, parks. So it, it's not, it doesn't have like the highest, most urban walk score or transit score or bike score, um, but there, it's not in the middle of nowhere either. So, you know, in taking that into account, um, we really wrestled with like what is the the optimal parking configuration and again we thought wow 124 parking spaces for 75 units feels like too much uh, we still have plenty of one and two bedroom units um and so i think where we've landed at 100 spaces you know feels a bit like the sweet spot so um that project is uh what in our local you know industry parlance we call income averaging so it's for Households earning from 30% area median income up to 80% area median income. 80% AMI is really kind of on par with market in Longmont. So we had to take that into account as well. Like, okay, these are folks who could rent in a market rate unit. There's not a lot of four bedrooms that are available on the market in Longmont. So, you know, I think by default, we're providing a, um, a unit type that's not otherwise available. But um, I mean, to be perfectly honest, a, a lot of it is truly a bit of an experiment. I don't, I don't think you can ever truly nail it and provide the perfect amount of parking for your residents for the next 15 years or beyond. But, um, but we, we landed there feeling like that was, that felt like the sweet spot. It felt right, right. 
Thank you. And I, I'm going to combine two questions given our time here. Uh, there are two that have come in, both related to office vacancies, uh, one particularly referencing Denver's very high office vacancy rate. Um, what one is, have you looked into shared parking arrangements with some of these empty office parking lots? Um, and secondarily, is it financially viable for developers to convert unused office buildings into housing, uh, given their, their existing parking podiums? I'll pass that I out to anyone who wants to take it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say I have a thought on that and would welcome what Kevin and Shannon think too. Um, I think uh, shared parking agreements are a really great strategy and they work best in places where there aren't municipal requirements for a number of parking spaces because a lot of times when the parking is mandated, that kind of uh, agreement for parking offsite or just adjacent doesn't really count because it's not on on your site. So that's a strategy that we've considered. And I really think that, um, you know, should this bill be successful, it'll open up a lot more opportunities for that. And then, um, you know, not to dive all the way into the affordable housing world, but I do think that there are opportunities to convert office buildings to affordable housing. It's happening in some places in the state. They're challenges and a lot of creativity is needed in that space too but you know i think it's something we should all be thinking about would anyone else like to add on to that before we move to another question no all right great we can feel a little bit more here another one from the audience here uh, what are the financing partners parking requirements impacts on your projects where local requirements aren't the barrier. And, and to clarify here, there have been a few questions in the chat about, you know, once we once, once we take the limits away, are there continued barriers from a financing perspective, whether working with an affordable or non-affordable development? Yeah, that, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, I can I can take that. I think, you know, a lot of the lenders that, that we work with, um, they rely on your studies. And so when we talk about these demand studies, uh, free market studies, you'll share those with your lenders and everything's going to go through. So you can make your case to say, like, here's what the data says. This is what the, the actual demand is. Like, are you a lender that will, you know, that will land based on this actual data? That's part of it. I know that um, at CHAPA, who's our state tax credit allocator, who Katie and Finn and I all rely on for the you know, loan from housing tax credit equity that really drives these affordable housing projects, is that they have their own parking unit. And so that brings up a, a separate challenge. And I think from their lens, they're looking at it from an uh, equity standpoint, as in uh, not financial equity, but you know, just social equity. You know, is it you know, something that we're not providing just to, you know, we're not providing income bit or parking just to lower income rates? And so from that standpoint, yes, it is still a challenge that we need to overcome. Okay, thank you for that. That's an interesting uh, sort of caveat to this whole discussion of, of, of what could come next, even after the limits are, are eliminated. Um, we have run to time here, and I have one closing slide. So, so sorry for those who have not gotten their questions answered, but, but I do think we need to conclude at this point. Um, I do want to thank again our three panelists for joining us here, as well as Representative Stephanie Behill and Matt Fromer, our, our presenter, um, and John Hersey for moderating there. Um, I will conclude us with one more slide for the group on next steps. Um, so for those of you who have been thoroughly persuaded by all the discussion tonight, um, do be on the lookout for uh, Representative Stephanie V. Hill's bill dropping in the next few days will be introduced shortly with the name um, equal or similar to limiting min minimum parking requirements. Uh, please do tell your networks, uh, reach out to your friends, write your legis legislators in support. Um, if you'd like more detail on the progress of this bill and those like it, um, please feel free to reach out to this email address. As I think I've mentioned in the chat, we will send this presentation, this recording, and a written primer on all of this out to your emails um, tomorrow. Um, and finally, for those of you who are interested in this topic and topics like this and want to learn more about what's going on in sort of the housing and transportation space in the uh, State Assembly this session, uh, we'll pitch that UMB Denver is having a meetup on February 15th a legislative kickoff 
Um, should be a large event to intro many of the legislators and many of the bills that are being worked on this session relating to housing and land use and transportation. Um, so we'd be welcome to have you down at Wine Coop in downtown Denver uh, in about a week. Um, with that, I'll, I'll stop our recording and say good night to everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.